What's up everybody, welcome to another episode of China Update where I try and help you guys keep on top of the world's number two economy. My name is Tony, it's been a very busy week, we've got a lot to cover. I've just come back from a business trip to Beijing, so this is coming out Sunday evening. I couldn't cover everything I wanted to in this uh, video this week, but there are some key things we need to cover so we're on top of things as we move into next week. So I hope you guys enjoy it. So let's just jump in. First up, we're going to discuss the G7 and NATO meetings that we've seen recently, which has had a greater focus on China than in the past. These are the mentions of China and the G7 uh, communicated a statement uh, released uh, over the last week, which show us key concerns from these European nations, the US and Japan. Quote, we also call for a timely, transparent, expert-led and science-based WHO convened Phase 2 COVID-19 origin study, including as recommended by the experts' report in China. At the same time, and in doing so, we will promote our values, including by calling on China to respect human rights and fundamental freedoms, especially in relation to Xinjiang and those rights, freedoms and high degree of autonomy for Hong Kong enshrined in the Sino-British Joint Declaration and the Basic Law. We underscore the importance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and encourage the peaceful resolution of cross-strait issues. We remain seriously concerned about the situation in the East and South China Seas and strongly oppose any unilateral attempts to change the status quo and increase tensions. End quote. So we can see three key themes here. The first is COVID. The second is human rights, particularly in Xinjiang and Hong Kong. And the third are geopolitical flashpoints around the territorial periphery of the PRC. Now, the PRC reaction to the G7 statement was as expected. Quote, the communique issued fact-distorting content on Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Taiwan and other matters, confounding right and wrong. This wanton smearing of China and blatant interference in its internal affairs frequently violates the basic norms of international relations and further exposes the ulterior motives of a handful of countries, including the United States. We are gravely concerned and firmly opposed to this. End quote. Unsurprising, uh, unsurprisingly, too, state media uh, pushed the uh, imperialism narrative, expressing without a hint of irony, quote, Yet it seems that such a zero-sum mentality still prevails in the capitals of some nations. And it seems that some of the decision-makers of these countries still refuse to wake up from their imperial colonial dreams. End quote. And Foreign Ministry spokesperson Zhao Lijian, in his characteristic manner, adopted more radical language in responding to the NATO meeting, which was also held over the last week, expressing at a press conference, quote, NATO has a long history of poor records. And the international community will not forget the 78 days of indiscriminate bombing of Yugoslavia by NATO without the approval of the UN. And the Chinese people will never forget the historical tragedy of the bombing of the Chinese embassy in Yugoslavia. NATO owes a debt of blood to the Chinese people. End quote. According to the latest National Reproductive Health Survey in the PRC, China has seen its, fertil its infer infertility, rather, infertility rate rise from 12% in 2007 to 18% in 2020, meaning that one out of every 5.6 couples of childbearing age faces difficulties in having a child. To put that in perspective, the infertility rate in the United States is between 6 and 8%, and global rates sit at between 12 to 15%. Earlier this year, uh, an expert in Jiangsu uh, had estimated that infertility in China would rise to 18%, by 2025, suggesting that this jump in infertility has occurred much sooner than expected and the situation may well continue to deteriorate. Of course, on the individual family level, this process is devastating to many couples who want children who can't have them. But for our purposes here, we need to think about what this means for policymakers in Beijing who are already deeply concerned about a rapidly aging population and historically low birth rates. Both things that we've discussed a lot over the last few months already. This increase in infertility can now be added to the shrinking number of women of childbearing age, as well as the wider social phenomenon of couples choosing to have fewer children as the main hurdles facing policymakers wanting to slow China's demographic collapse. 
If you guys enjoying the content, don't forget to hit that like button. It's a huge help for a new YouTuber like myself. It tells the algorithm that this is real content from a real creator, which is particularly useful since a lot of these subjects are not promoted by YouTube because they're deemed as sensitive. And I want to take this opportunity to say a big thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for supporting a new channel. I think it is important to listen to outspoken public uh, intellectuals and uh, influential officials in government in the current nationalistic climate that are shaping public discourse and ideology within the PRC. Some have tremendous influence on policymakers and even some in the Han Chinese diaspora around the world who share these nationalistic worldviews. From time to time here, I think we should examine some of these voices influencing ideology so we have a better understand of uh, understanding rather of how these debates are being formed in China. Today we're going to be looking at an interview uh, with the PRC ambassador to France, uh, Mr. Um, Lu Xiaoye, who is regarded as a hardliner when it comes to Xi Jinping thought on diplomacy. This interview has made quite a few waves domestically here and internationally. I have shortened the quotes that we're going to look at here for brevity's sake and the original is uh, the original interview was in Chinese and I will include a link in the description below. Quote, Wolf warrior diplomacy is the label that the West has attached to China in recent years. Just as an aside here, guys, we should note that the label wolf warrior diplomacy was actually first coined in the PRC state media before it became popularized in international media. In fact, I, re I distinctly remember reading it in state media before seeing it in English. We'll continue. Behind this is not only the West's inability to adapt to the change of China's diplomatic style, but also the West's anxiety about China's rise. There is a powerful anti-China force in Western society, which wants to attack and discredit China unilaterally without any response from China. When China responds and fights back, they are unhappy. Westerners accuse us of not conforming to diplomatic etiquette. But the standard for us to evaluate our work is not how foreigners look at us, but how people in China look at us, whether it is in the interest of our country and people, whether our people are satisfied or not. Our work is evaluated by these standards, not whether foreigners are happy or not. End quote. What is important uh, for us to understand here is that when, when we look at this language, we can see that he's not just saying this. He truly believes uh, what he is saying here. And this is a deeply held worldview of Han Chinese nationalists, I believe, from key uh, diplomats to officials and many in the middle class. Uh, there is a deep sense of grievance in this worldview as well as uh, moral righteousness, a potent element of any ideology. We'll continue with the quote. Quote, In the previous era, perhaps the whole diplomatic arrangement sought a more conciliatory atmosphere. In addition, to be honest, our national strength was not so strong at that time, and we needed to hide our strength and bide our time. Here referring to the Deng Xiaoping era diplomatic maxim, Tao Wang Yang Hui. For diplomats, there is a diplomatic mission for an era, and you must meet the requirements of the era. This change in diplomatic style is an objective necessity, which is not the so-called wolf warriors diplomacy as described by Westerners. In the eyes of Westerners, our diplomacy is aggressive and offensive. In fact, it is them, not us, who are really aggressive and offensive. We never take the initiative to attack others, never take the initiative to provoke. We're just defending ourselves and protecting our own interests. Our capacity to engage in the struggle is improving all the time. At this pace, I believe we will do better and better in coming years. Our young people, who were born in the 1990s or later, are the hope of our country in the future, because they have the strongest self-confidence in our country. Since they were born, China has been a rising power, and there is no reason to feel inferior. Therefore, with such a group of young people around, I believe we will fight the West in this public opinion war with increasing confidence into the future. End. Quote. On Thursday, Hong Kong's National Security Police arrested the editor-in-chief and four directors of the Apple Daily newspaper for, quote, collusion with a foreign country or with external elements to engage and to endanger national security, end quote, in breach of Article 29 of the National Security Law, which was imposed by Beijing over the Special Administrative Region of Hong Kong last year. National Security uh, Unit Senior Superintendent Steve Lee said the operation was launched at 6 a.m. in the morning on Thursday and involved uh, approximately 500 officials or officers. He said 18 million Hong Kong dollars worth of assets have been frozen. 
Mr. Lee said that the alleged uh, fence involved around 30 Chinese and English language Apple Daily articles published from 2019, suggesting that the national security law will indeed be enforced retroactively. Uh, state media here in the mainland were very supportive of the arrests. Quote, the basic law guarantees Hong Kong residents can enjoy freedom of speech, press and publication. But none of these rights and freedoms are borderless and cannot cross the bottom line of national security. End quote. A piece uh, by out, uh, outspoken academic Tian Fei Long may give us a clue as to what may be next for Hong Kong in the future. He wrote this week in a piece, quote, Unfortunately, under British colonial rule in Hong Kong, the narrative of the Kuomintang and the distortion of various anti-communist forces, Hong Kong society has experienced a considerable degree of anti-communist thoughts and actions, and have always been in a state of struggle with the tradition of patriotism and love for Hong Kong. To exercise these mistaken ideas of the West, Hong Kong people must be taught the true history of the party. End quote. Okay, guys, I know that was a short one. I'm sorry. Like I said, I just got back Sunday night from Beijing, but there are a few things that I really want to cover. I hope you uh, enjoyed the episode and found it interesting. Throw your views below, as always, if you want to discuss anything. And as always, I hope you're staying safe, staying sane. I will see you next time on China Update.